back again to talk some more wrestling. We've got Robbie, we've got Austin, we've got Kevin, and we've got the Olympic trials and some more coaching movement to get into. So first, let's get into the news that we talked about last week, had to cut out of the show because it wasn't official yet. Um, and now it is official. So um, Robbie, since you're stealing more of the people from the IWA and you know you were basically first on this one, why don't you discuss who Virginia Tech now has? Well, Zach Tonelli is going to be making the move down <clears throat> from Columbia to be the associate associate head coach. Him and Frey are both going to be associate head coaches. Um, so I'm not sure what that means, if anything, but probably better pay than assistant coach. But huge move. Uh, great for them. Uh, Tonelli's a fantastic coach. He did a lot of great things at Columbia, building them up. And if you see, you know, that team kind of got the bad end of the deal with COVID years because they're they're kind of a skeleton of what they were with a lot of their talent being fifth years now um, and having to leave the Ivy. Um, so a lot of a lot of schools are benefiting from that. A couple ACC schools, well, uh, Lennox Wolak is is also going to be at Virginia Tech, and then uh, Ogan Sanya is heading down to North Carolina. So we're benefiting from some of that. But huge move to to get another head coach caliber coach on staff in Blacksburg. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's a pretty good hire and yeah, I I can't tell the difference between associate and assistant head coach. Maybe it, maybe it is something in the contract or whatever else, who knows. I Um, think whoever came up with that is the same person that came up with second semis, you know, (laughs) it's just, these are all just made up terms now for another coach. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, all the different made up terms that we have in wrestling. I mean, we've got recruiting coordinators and you know, the director of ops, which, you know, which is student a, athlete development coordinator. Yeah. Like, I mean, director of ops is probably the only true title that, that I've seen. Um, but you know, all these other things are getting more and more made up to have more talent in the room. So, um, or at least on staff, I should say, maybe not even in the room, but very good hire. Certainly, you know, very weird though, that over the last two years and, you know, obviously I think it's a different situation with Coleman leaving, you know, but we've had two guys go from head coach to associate head coach at a different program. You know, obviously the money is a factor, you know, you have to certainly match some salaries of, of the head coaches as they come in as a, as associate head coaches, but maybe it's, you know, a little bit less headache, right. As a, as an associate head, as opposed to a head coach of a program and, Obviously, you know, Virginia Tech is going to have more resources than than you would at, at Columbia. The recruiting is a little bit different. The guys that you have to recruit to get into Columbia is obviously very much so different as well. And just You're saying to, that you Virginia know, Tech's not an Ivy League program. It, it is not, <laughs> unfortunately. How um, dare you? They have a good vet school. They have a really good vet school. <laughs> well, I mean, what else do you need, right? True. I think a big part of it for him. Uh, was kind of a personal move and a family move. He's got young kids, you know, raising kids in the city is not for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to do it. And my kids are similar age to his. So I can I completely understand wanting to get to a, a smaller area, have a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more freedom for the kids. So I think that that was a big part of it. Um, cost of living is slightly cheaper uh, in the Blacksburg metropolitan area than it is in New York City. So I think uh, the paycheck will go a little bit further down there as well. That's awesome. Good for him. Another coaching move we had was we finally found out who the Buffalo head coach is going to be, and it's going to be Donnie Vincent. And it kind of came on the heels of a not so good article about Buffalo that had come out about their facilities and how things looked and, you know, how Stutzman was treated. And you've got, you know, a number of wrestlers talking about how bad it was and how they went to administration about things and administration saying, you know, we didn't know about these things. So, you know, on the heels of that, we hear, you know, Donnie Vincent is going to be the new head coach at Buffalo. He even cut his hair for the entire ordeal. So this is, this is a big deal. He's cutting his hair. He's getting a new head coaching job. Hopefully it's business time. it is business time, but hopefully the, anything that was reported in that article is either remedied or, you know, or or something has to happen, right? You don't want to see a guy come into 
a horrible situation. And if you read that article, if you didn't, I highly suggest you go read it. If you did read it, hopefully you're with us and thinking you don't want to see somebody come into that kind of um, situation, especially as, you know, head coach for the first time. Um, Austin, what are your thoughts on the move for him leaving Cornell and going to Buffalo? And, and I know you had some other news that had just dropped as well for Cornell. Yeah. Cornell, um, I, they, they love Donnie Vinson there. He did a really good job working with those middleweights, everyone, you know, and he, you know, he's from the area. He's from upstate New York. So, you know, staying home is good for him, but, you know, kind of like you said, it just, I'd hate to see him go into a bad situation, you know, and, um, maybe Buffalo doesn't improve much, but you know, it wouldn't be because of Donnie Vincent because of things that we kind of discussed, you know, so not to be all gloomy, but you know, it, it, it could be a bad situation for him, but you know, obviously hoping the best, I think they, uh, made some promises to him and put a lot of faith into him as, you know, young energetic guy leading the helm. And I think he'll do a good job there. And on the heels of that, Cornell just, uh, announced that coach Cullen Russell will be the associate head coach moving forward, um, with some jobs opening up in the Ivy League now maybe a little defensive maneuver there by Cornell to you know lock him in long term prevent him from leaving so I think good move good move all around there yeah gonna be really interesting to see who goes on to Columbia now with that opening happening um you know we've still has a still have a couple of openings left the Central Michigan one is obviously there um the one at Columbia now opens up with Vincent uh, or excuse me, with Tonelli taking that job and now Vincent in place of Buffalo, other coaching stuff that happened basically smack dab in the middle of the Olympic trials going on. And it was, I think it was for the community that was kind of in the know, uh, a head scratcher of how did it happen? And, you know, it was Bono getting an extension at Wisconsin, which was surprising based off of, the rumors that you heard, you heard things weren't good. You heard that, you know, wrestlers weren't happy. Certainly you had seen, you know, Dean Hamity a day after NCAAs is over is already in the transfer portal. And what, not even a week, not even, you know, within that same time span is already wearing, you know, the, the orange of Oklahoma state. Right. So Bono getting that extension is kind of surprising. Like I said, based on those rumors, but you, Obviously, you can't always believe what you hear because what's happening inside those walls of Wisconsin is privy to the people that are there, you know? So any rumors about Askren being on campus, trying to persuade people, trying to do this, trying to do that, who's to know really what was being said? Who's to know what was happening? Um, you know, even though him and Bono certainly don't get along, still kind of a head scratcher moment when it comes to why was Askren even there? And then seeing that Bono gets an extension through 2029 after I think it was just a couple of years, not maybe like a year or two ago, he got an extension through 2027. So um, him and reader are going to continue to keep the the team together. If you know, we're reading the, the, the tea leaves or the tweet leaves, I guess I should say um, the right way with, with what reader put out on Twitter. Um, so we'll see, we'll certainly see what happens and, you know, that lineup is going to ultimately be a little bit different without Hamity being in the lineup. And then Braxton Amos has another shoulder injury that happens at the Olympic trials. And you really feel for him. And I had a chance to catch up with him um, before the season when he announced he was taking an Olympic red shirt. And now another shoulder injury, you know, shoulder goes out again and, you know, said it was out and in or something like that. Robbie, you were there. What was kind of being said in the tunnel and, and what did you hear and see? Uh, it didn't look good. Uh, and I've had four shoulder reconstructions, so I, I, I feel the pain that Braxton was having there. And you could kind of see the look on his face was like, oh, shit, I just got this fixed. It just went out again. Um, the trainer didn't have good things to say to Reader and Bono about it. Said it looked it didn't wasn't a good one. Um, Braxton was walking with the sling on the rest of the weekend. Hopefully it's a it's heals quickly he's able to get whatever he needs to fixed um shoulder injuries are really really tricky and they I mean especially in in wrestling I mean even if you haven't had shoulder surgery I'm sure at some point you've you've got your shoulder jerked on pretty good and it doesn't feel good so it's uh it's going to be a weak spot moving forward and it's going to be something that he's going to have to contend with forever and that's that's really tough um 
especially at a you know bigger guy who uses upper body well. So that's it's going to be tough for him. Yeah, yeah, certainly a shitty situation, and you really feel for the kid because he put in so much time, especially with taking an Olympic redshirt, and now he may have to take a medical in order to you know get over and possibly another surgery and more rehab and everything else in order to you know maybe come back in what. 2025 2026 um to the wisconsin lineup so you know that really sucks to see and you know hopefully we we hear some some good news or at least you know he kind of fills us in at some point on kind of what his progress is um some of the other coaching stuff obviously we're still waiting to hear about oklahoma state and who their next coach is i think everybody's kind of betting that it's going to be holman scott um i think that might come this week honestly uh, I don't think that they're going to waste too much time on, you know, who they're going to name. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, we talked about it before, a bunch of rumors that were out there about who they were going after. I don't really think that they held too much water. So, um, you know, hopefully we hear back at least from them and see what is going to be happening in Stillwater. Um and Austin, I think you said that, what is it, uh, Princeton still has a, a couple of openings that they're going to be looking at people too? Yeah, talking to Coach Dubuque last week, uh, said he still has two job openings left. He's still interviewing for those. Um, did not get any names, any indicators of, you know, lightweight, middleweight, heavyweight, whatever those are. But, you know, Coach Dubuque being a lightweight and having um, Cody Brewer in there now, another lightweight guy. So I'm expecting at least a middleweight, and heavyweight, you know, upper weight guy he's imagined looking for unless a really good candidate comes up. So just my two cents and my guess there. Yeah, you had a really good point of, you know, teams waiting until after the trials to see, you know, who retires, who's going to be available, who wants to coach. Um, you know, obviously we had a couple of guys, and we'll get into that, that did retire, and there's certainly going to be plenty more guys. Um that are saying that this was their last quad and they're going to get into coaching and things like that. Um, but yeah, it'd be really interesting to see who heads out to Princeton. Um, Kevin, any, any updates that, you know, in, in Michigan of what's going on with your alma mater? I wish, man. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm, I think I'm just as eager to find out as uh, you know, who gets hired as, as the coaching candidates at this point, you know, they're kind of just, waiting to find out if they get the job or not. Um, I haven't heard anything, you know, I, I, on one, you know, one level, I'm, I'm kind of like, okay, well, they're doing their due diligence. That's great. And then, you know, they, it's not like they're losing out on additional candidates at this point. You know, I think they kind of have their last candidates like in mind. Um, but you'd like to see some decisiveness too. You know, you'd like to see a move on it and allow that coach to, to have a chance to really, you know, dive head first into whatever, recruiting they need to get going on and, and everything else that you need to do as a head coach. So I'm hoping sooner rather than later, man, we'll see. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, you know, Mark Hall did, did retire. And I, I think, you know, we said before we came on, we don't really see him leaving Penn, but um, you know, he's got ties to being in Michigan. So who knows? Maybe we'll, we'll see him make a move closer to home and, take a, take a coaching job at a, at a new place or, you know, whether he stays at Penn or not, but I know he's, you know, doing very well as a coach at Penn and he's, he's loving it there in, in Philadelphia. Um, then obviously with, with uh, Brody Brewer leaving, you have Tonelli that's in there. So, you know, just a lot of, a lot of different coaching things. And obviously there's a lot more rumor. So I'm sure like in the next couple of weeks we'll hear of more guys moving and, and a lot of things kind of moving around and, and that coaching carousel hits pretty hard when it does. So um yeah <clears throat> Adam Hall filling his staff out at Utah Valley as well. Yeah I was gonna say any any news there? Yeah. Nothing specific yet. I've heard some names but uh, um nothing official. So if, if I'm building a staff, I don't know if he's has interest in getting back into coaching, but there's you know, a guy like Nick Heflin, uh, who left Oklahoma when, when Kish came in, he seemed to be a really good coach. Like he's obviously a bigger dude. Um, he's somebody I would try to go after if he's available. Yeah. Heflin's a good dude. I made the mistake of when he was at OU, um, 
I was doing a, a, a show where I decided to work out with just some of the mammoths of wrestling. One, one was Casper. I did a workout with Casper at Duke. I did one with Gwiz when he was still at NC state. And I, and I did one with Heflin and I was, I mean, out of every single one of them, I was just like crawling home, but Heflin is an absolute beast, man. And, you know, he's an awesome guy, put me through a serious workout. So I would love to see him get back into the mix and, and be able to, you know, get back into the coaching corner. I know how much he loved being in the corner and how much he loved just being a coach and being in the room. Uh, I know he's been doing a lot of jujitsu lately. Uh, I think he's been doing some competitions in jujitsu and he always was before, but I think he's since getting out of getting out of coaching, I think he's been doing some more, some more jujitsu. So not straying too far from competition. Gentlemen, let's dig into the trials. It was, absolutely wild and not just the stuff to happen on the mat um which you know we'll we'll close our conversation out with but let's start with the women um you know ladies first in this place they were seriously scrapping and you know i was very impressed by every single one of them i think the finals was great you know, none of them were complete blowouts um, when it came to any of the women. I think the the only one that truly was was, you know, Helen pinning Jakara in, in that first round. Helen's got such great technique. She's so technical that, you know, stepping behind a foot, getting her head in there and just kind of sitting her back to straight feet to back. You know, we've seen her hit that a number of times and she just continues to perfect it and hit it and hit it and hit it and you know, it was, it was there and she took it against Jakara and, um, you know, that was a great match. And it was just so wild because you look up and down the the finals and you've got very high level world medalists sitting at home that are not going to be in the Olympics. And it's just like absolutely wild to see the depth that we have on the women's side of things for so long. We've obviously talked about the hammers coming out of the NCAA that get into onto the freestyle side of things. And, you know, all the guys that we've had there, the women have been consistent and have continued to just ascend and ascend. And, you know, to the point now where, like I said, we've got medalists like Adeline that didn't make the team this year, you know, we got Forrest Molinari not making the team Jakara, you know, world champ, not making the team. Hello Gello was, you know, uh, an Olympian, not make the team and you know Haley wrestled extremely well for somebody who had you know hung up the shoes and then decided to come back you know comes all the way back and makes the finals it was great to watch all the competition and all the parody from the women that really went out and scrapped um Robbie what was the atmosphere like for the women's wrestling and you know just kind of talk about what it was like kind of watching those finals and watching the women compete because you were there I mean, it, it's uh, it's always humbling to see Helen, especially because she's such a technician, and you never know. Like she, she's good. She's so good at so much, and you never know kind of which way she's going to attack. And it's so varied, but it's always just so crisp, and it's it's just impressive to watch her work. Um, with her, it was it was nice talking to her afterwards because she seems like she's finally feels like she's fully healthy or as fully healthy as she's going to be. Um, and I think that's a, a, a huge, huge moment for her kind of feeling like she's over that hump because it was such a, such a challenge for her to go through all that. Um, kind of overall, it was uh, a lot of youth, a lot of youth um, putting on a show. I mean, you had Kennedy making the team, knocking out Adeline, um, but you had oh, it's a high school senior in the finals, mm-hmm. correct? Audrey, yep. she's a high school senior, and that's damn impressive. Um, she looked great the whole tournament too. I mean, she got shut down in the finals, but that that's not to be <laughs> not not completely unexpected. But yeah, I was really impressed. Kind of overall, um, the depth is is so much more than it ever has been. Uh, you see a lot of these co- girls who were in college now who are challenging the you know the girls who are higher up on the ladder. So you're really seeing a lot of growth um in the depth and in the talent so it's it's good to see yeah yeah i mean the the high schoolers 
on, you know, the men's and women's side were just amazing, you know, and, you know, Audrey was, was great. And I loved the, obviously you were there, obviously you couldn't hear it, but um, the commentators were talking about how her plan was to go to prom and then leave to go to the Olympics, like two, three days after prom. So like, you know, the fact that we have like such depth from such a young age is, is so incredible. And obviously we'll get to the things that the, that the, the young men did on, on their end of the, but I loved watching her compete. You know, it was great to see her compete. Obviously she's up against Sarah Hildebrand, who has been consistently one of the best in the world and, you know, consistent on just being on top. And that was like an amazing part to see how good Jimenez looked and then to be like, man, she still has levels to go because Sarah yeah. Hildebrandt is a monster. And the thing that's funny about Sarah, and you can you can tell, is she never actually expects to win. Every <laughs> single one of her celebrations is like she's surprised that it actually happened. And I'm like, Sarah, like you're you're really good. You, you I'm sure you know you're good, but like let's let's take this in a little bit more like but you can tell she's super surprised every time she wins and you know <laughs> and that's the thing like, i think up and down the the entire line like each one of these girls was was great sports and you know just ready to compete um you know you talked about helen and the battles that that she faced you know always good to see her back but jakara talked about today releasing um that she had knee surgery two weeks ago and so that, you know, she wasn't going to be able to wrestle like that's badass, you know, like I've had knee surgeries and I'm like, I don't even want to walk to the bathroom, let alone <laughs> go out and, and wrestle against the Olympic champion who has beaten one of the absolute best female wrestlers to ever sit on the ever step on the mat. Right. So, you know, hat off to Jakara for coming out and competing. And um, that kind of puts in into perspective why she wasn't able to make 53 everybody was like, man, she missed weight. And then you're like, well, she just had surgery two weeks ago. So cutting weight, I don't think was really a thing. So like incredible performance by her to, to move up and do what she did. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the women were, were great. And I have so much confidence. I think we, we get at least four medals um, from that women's team um at least four you know i think every single one of them can honestly medal but i think we get at least four with the with the team that that we have here um austin yeah, i thought it was Kevin, i thought I it was cool yeah i thought it was cool um i was watching the stream on tv and on peacock whatever it was and they showed i don't know if you guys saw they showed a graphic of the amount of female wrestler participants at the high school level during helen's gold medal it was like a few thousand right now it's like 30 40 thousand just the exponential growth we've seen. And, you know, she's a, probably the main part, if not the biggest part of that, right? So it was cool to see her continue that dominance and make a, a third Olympic Games, which is just incredible. And you touch on the youth, like, all, yeah, all those girls watched her win that Olympic medal, and now they're kind of her competition, which is, you know, it's, it kind of comes full circle. It's really cool to see. And I think there were two 20-year-olds on the team, uh, Elor, and blades you know they can't even go out and celebrate and have a beer afterwards legally <laughs> you know it's just stuff like that just really cool to me see how how young and so amazingly good these females are you know then you look at i mean and she's got what seven world championships and she's 20 yeah. she's a yeah she's yeah she's so good and like so quietly amazing like mm -hmm. she's she's humble she is i mean it's just it's so impressive to see what she's done and continues to do and continues to challenge herself. Like that's the most impressive thing about her is like she made a, a senior world team and she's, you know, could have just glided with that and gone to the senior world championship. So she's like, no, nah, I'm still eligible for, for juniors and U23. So let's do both of those as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's insane and amazingly impressive. So kudos to her. I mean, I, I would love to see her win an Olympic medal, an Olympic gold to, to add to that, that count. Yeah, imagine the imagine the gangster you have to be to be like, I'm gonna win three world titles this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kevin, anything it? from the women's side? Okay, Kevin. Uh, just just super impressed. I mean, uh, across across the board, I, uh, we talked a little bit about Haley Agello and her making her comeback and and making it all the way to the finals, and 
you know, losing two matches by a combined three points, right, against Dom Parrish, who two years ago, world champion. So um, that was impressive. But yeah, Helen just looks ha- healthy. She looks healthy. She looks like she's enjoying herself uh, way more than she had been the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, and then Sarah, Sarah's just that energy. It's it's very positive energy. So I'm a, I'm a Sarah big fan. and Dom, they're both just yeah. They're always a fun interview. You're always going to get some something quality out of both of them. I like those hats everybody got when they made the team. Oh, one of those cool. hats. Yeah. Did you see? Did you see Mason's hat? Yeah, that's the no. best one. Oh, the it's backwards one. The, the no, Paris, it says, Paris, it says the Paris, Paris and Paris. He explained oh, nice. it was like you know, this destiny. I'm 24. It's 2024. Paris and Paris. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, that's pretty that is cool. awesome. Yeah, yeah, this team is amazing. It's going to be awesome to watch. I think we're we're we don't realize how spoiled we are. Um, when we look at the men's team, we're like, man, we've got, you know, this four-time champion and, you know, Jordan Burroughs is a seven-time champion. Like, we've got all these NCAA champs and all these world medals and all this. And you look at the women's side and you're like, every single one of these girls has some sort of age-level world medal or senior world medal or is a world champion. And it's just like, I think we're we're super spoiled. And we've gotten used to just seeing our women's team go out and just absolutely dominate and you know, I think, I honestly think that we're probably one of the only countries that's like, we need 10 weights, right? Like at least that's pushing for it more than, than any other country because we have so much depth in our country for, you know, the, on the freestyle side, at least when it comes to men's and women's, um, you know, Greco obviously is, has a lot of catching up to do, but like the men's and women's freestyle side, we're like, we need 10 weights because we need more of our guys and girls to go out and kick the asses of, you know, the, the foreign guys and girls that, that don't have, you know, a good enough 10 weights. So hopefully John Smith said that it's, it's his retired mission to push the IOC to 10 weights. So if anybody can get it done, it's, it's John Dub. Yeah. He'll get it done. <laughs> enough money. IOC will do anything for you. <laughs> I, I would also like to petition that Kennedy Blades comes to Ann Arbor to the Cliff Keen Wrestling Club so that we can have all three heavyweights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That, it's it's kind of not fair. You you guys are kind of a heavyweight factory right now. It's going well. It's going well for the moment. Yeah, I mean, let's let's dive into Greco. 130 is, is the weight that is one of the three weights that are qualified um, for the Olympics in Greco. Adam Kuhn losing the first match and then winning the next two against Colton Schultz. Those guys have gone back and forth for so long, you know, even to the point where, you know, Colton was, was a a tiny little pup. Now he's, you know, basically a bull mastiff out there with, with (laughs) no neck, you know, and Adam Kuhn is even bigger than that. So like seeing how these guys have competed, um, over the years and you know the the one one score obviously everybody's like man greco's boring this that whatever they just had a one one score everything else but i think it's a testament kind of to the parody of the two of them as well as the technique you know you wrestle somebody that much you're gonna know what's coming you're gonna know where where the openings are you're gonna know how to create those angles and do basically anything that you need to do but the other person's gonna know that it's coming too so i think you know so many of our guys have met so much on the mat in Greco that there's not, there's no surprise. There's absolutely no surprise, but you know, Adam well, Kuhn being able to come back and beat Colton Schultz after <laughs> losing the first one was pretty impressive. A big part of that. And that's something that Ellis hit on is that, you know, the WCAP, the world-class athlete program, I think that's the acronym. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I mean, the majority of the team is from the army. And Ellis was going through naming off, you know, all these people that are in the room every day, including, you know, there was multiple finals that were that were WCAP versus WCAP. So, you know, that's kind of the center of our Greco program right now. Um, you know, Peyton Jacobson hit on some other things with the accelerator program they have and uh, what they're doing in northern Michigan. And that's they're kind of revamping some things as well. So the effort is there within the Greco community to improve the product. Um, I'm hopeful that over the next couple of years that that continues to happen, but 
I mean, I've, I've always liked Greco. I know it's not super exciting for everyone. Um, I've always been an upper body guy. So it, it's, it's entertaining for me to see just how, you know, such a small adjustment and the nuance of it makes such a big difference. Um, I understand it's not the most visibly exciting sport, but you know, I enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, I if Kamal Bay's out on the mat, you're going to yeah, see some fun. stuff, you know, yeah. like, Joe Rao is out on the mat against Alan Vera. You're going to see some stuff like those guys mm -hmm. absolutely go for it. So like, I don't, I think that there are certainly times where it is, you know, two guys fighting for position and not finding any sort of openings, but then, you know, I think domestically we just have so much parody and, you know, we, we obviously lost a, a big one in, in Hancock going over and trying to be a WWE superstar. And he's, really doing it too so hat off to mm -hmm. him for you know finding his his niche over over wwe but like man it really hits hard when stuff like that happens but i think that the guys that we have can continue to pick that up um but i'm super happy for joe Rao. um obviously alan vera is still a really formidable pro opponent and a guy that i think you know you know i'd have the utmost confidence in to go out and, and score some points and and possibly bring home a medal but also chiseled like a Greek statue. That he's also a, a soccer player as well. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. He's also a soccer player. He talked about that at the U.S. Open where he had, I think, like a couple weeks, maybe even like a month prior to the U.S. Open, he had signed a pro or semi-pro soccer contract. Um, so, and he even said like soccer <laughs> is his like number one love. Like he loves Greco. He loves wrestling, but like soccer is where it's at for him. So um, no rest for him. I think he just, you know, gets back out on the field, laces up the cleats and gets going. But, man, really happy to see Joe Rao finally get his spot on the team after everything that he's gone through and just, like, had to fight for. Um, it's awesome to have him on the team and and know that, like, he's gone through some really tough times and that, like, he's going to bring that all out on the mat and we're going to see it. So hopefully he can go out and bring home a medal, but man, like it was just like another one of those kind of happy, sad moments where you're like, man, that guy's been through so much, you yeah. know, but it's incredible to see him finally break through uh, guys. Any thoughts on, on Joe Rao? Dude seems to have a great sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. Always cracking people up. Uh, I tried to get him on the podcast a couple of years ago and, uh, he, I think he was, it was God, I think it was around COVID. Didn't they do like in Illinois, they had some big like Greco thing on the roof of some building. Yeah. It like yeah. It was, it, it was kind of wild, but yeah, I remember watching that. That was pretty cool. He was cracking jokes at that and yeah, seems like an all around awesome dude. So very happy for him. His I mean, show was Wyatt great. Hendrickson go off the stage. Can you imagine going off the, the building? That oh, seems yeah. very, very <laughs> unsafe. Yeah, that's why, that's why Don Bradley wasn't invited. To <laughs> it's funny though, looking at like the just the Greco Roman results here, or whatever, and it's like, you know, we're talking about storylines and some of these other ones. Like these are great storylines for each of these weights. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, Peyton Jacobson getting it done. <clears throat> um, you've got you know AK forty seven, the old man out there, just you know getting smoked by Kamal Bay in the finals. But hey, he made it. Like that's that's pretty awesome. Blind Squirrel himself, and then I was uh, Hefizov and and Roberts have battled in the finals. I feel like the World uh, Trials and Olympic Trials the last several years, and it's always a war. I feel like it always goes to three, but yeah, just you can always look at this and you're like, oh yeah, okay, Greco storylines are pretty fun. I'm happy yeah, for same all with Sancho, Sancho and Coleman are the same way too. Mm -hmm. I mean, they yeah. they back and forth a lot too. I mean, yeah, that's the, I think that's a big part of it and what you just hit on it. And that kind of comes down to us as well is, is making sure we, we highlight those storylines because I mean, Joe Rao's story is insane. Mm -hmm. um, this is his third Olympic team he's made. It's the first time he's going to the Olympics. That's, that's wild. I mean, right. and everything he went through, or I guess not third, but he was going to retire a couple of years ago. He did retire. Yeah. He retired yeah. after he got screwed out of the spot in 2020 and had to yeah. sue the USA wrestling. Like it's, it's a, it's a wild, wild history um, just within the sport. And then his story outside of the sport is even more impressive. Um, he kind of hit on some of that stuff after he won, you know, 
talking about some of the struggles he went through and how wrestling, you know, was the way that he got out of, you know, a lot of bad situations and how many bad friends, he, you know, how many friends he lost um, to addiction and things like that, that weren't able to get out and how wrestling, you know, served as the, as the precipice for him to get out of a, a lot of bad stuff. So, I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that we need to highlight and that's, you know, we, we need to do a better job of that. And I think that helps the overall product as well. We are important. You're right. Especially uh, Austin. Especially Austin. Yes. He moves the needle on everything. Can't wait for Austin to wrestle in the uh, old man tournament uh, there. In Is it on top of a building? It's not. No. Damn it. It's in a gymnasium. That's Austin's, not as rest- fun. Austin's wrestling it, though. He told me. Uh, Take right. it out of it I'm, now. I am commentating. I am not wrestling. <laughs> Neither bringing shoes. What if we put somebody in, like throw somebody on the scorer's table? Would that make you wrestle? Hey, if they break my laptop or something, or you know, knock over my coffee, I might have to get feisty. We don't know. There it is. <laughs> dun, dun, we can make uh, this happen. We've got enough WWE guys. We can make this happen. I think we can do yeah. it. Um, as long as uh, guys like Adam Coon and Schultz aren't there, <laughs> they're big boy. It's just watching. I didn't watch a ton of Greco, admittedly, um, but you know, I saw Coon and Schultz wrestling, and I was just like. How do you score on these guys? They're just it's so, a lot of mass. It's, it's like moving, trying to move a, a brick wall against my house. Like it's unreal. They're they're so big. Yeah, I, I I honestly like I've I've obviously seen a ton of these guys throughout. I can remember when the Ellis Coleman Flying Squirrel video came out, and yeah. everyone was attracted to wrestling. Um, but like Kamal Bay, we did a we did a like a trip to OPRF when uh, it was like him and uh, Larry early and a bunch of those guys that were still at OPRF. And I can remember his practice. They had to force him to shoot and stop throwing guys. They were like, come on, <laughs> this isn't Greco. Like you have to shoot because he was just throwing his teammates left and right. It, you name it. He was just trying to lock up and, and throw headlocks and lat drops and everything else like he's always been <laughs> such an explosive athlete the match that he had with mark hall i think was at uh the clash fargo. Was, oh, no, one no, in man. fargo too but before yeah. then there was one of the clash that like there was just all this talk because mark hall was mark hall back then and you know and and was you know the prodigy and and kamal bay was just like this greco specialist that they threw on a folk style mat and asked him to go wrestle. Right. And like, he was just trying to throw Mark, but Mark was just so much bigger at that point. And, <laughs> you know, but it was just like such a clash of Titans back then, you know? And, and then, you know, obviously every single highlight that he has of uh, being in Fargo, you know, you just knew that he was going to be a guy that was going to do really, really big things on the world stage. And hopefully he can, you know, get that first, that first senior level medal, um at a world championships i don't think he's gotten one yet i know he has some junior level ones but i just you know just love that kid and you know really happy for him that he makes another team and hopefully he can go and qualify the weight and you know make it to paris so um yeah that was my next question what do you guys think about if you got to qualify three more weights you think they're going to do it you know how many and you know what are the odds i don't really follow greco so i'm lost this one you guys (laughs) It, it's going to be really hard, honestly, because like just like freestyle where we missed out on qualifying 57 and 65, the same happened with Greco where Kamal mm-hmm. wasn't able to qualify the weight um, at Pan Ams too. So like there's just been something there. Right. And I don't think I don't know. what I can't remember the last time that we've qualified every single weight um because you know 65 hasn't been qualified in freestyle for a very long time obviously all the women are already qualified coming in three of the the weights what is it 87 97 and 130 are qualified for greco i think it's going to be tough honestly um and i think the the tournament in turkey is um you have to make the finals i believe so it's top three um repressage same same style as it would be a you know world and olympic tournament um so it's going to be they tough honestly they don't wrestle the final though correct once you get to the final you're you're good yeah i don't i don't think that they do <laughs> wrestle the the final um but yeah once you make the final and then i think the only the one that is wrestled obviously is is third place um 
is wrestled. I don't know. They might wrestle the final. They there there might be like a true second or something. Hmm. I'm not sure. I have to. I'd have to go go look and and see and kind of see where that's at. But yeah, there's you know a number of factors that I think obviously we're very good domestically. We don't see the results on the world stage. So as you know, as incredible as as our guys look up against each other, hasn't fully translated to the world stage just yet. And now on to the most controversial, I think, of the entire weekend. Um, men's freestyle. There was so much happening in men's freestyle. It was, and, and Robbie, you can speak to this better than anyone, it was basically the Nittany Lion Invitational. Um, with it obviously being in state college, but with them having a guy in, I think, what every single one of the finals. Um, so yeah, I mean, except for heavyweight, outside of heavyweight, heavyweight's the only one where they oh. didn't. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was just a lot of Nittany Lion on Nittany Lion fighting, and obviously the fans weren't the best, which we'll get to, but. This was, I mean, it, the the wrestling is, I think it's what we kind of expected, but then there's guys like Larkin who really showed up and showed out at 65. So um, let's kind of get into it. Robbie, any, any surprises, you know, you were there on the ground, any surprises in freestyle? Just, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a lot of the youth was, was big surprises. Jesse Mendez looked fantastic. Um, Lilladal looked good. Jax Forrest. I mean, it's it's just amazing to see these really young guys being ready to compete with senior level guys at that age. It's it's it was very impressive, um, and that that really got the crowd behind them as well. Uh, I mean, you mentioned with it kind of being the Nittany Line open. I mean, a large large number of these guys are from. Uh, the Nittany Lion Club or, or, you know, wrestled at, at Penn State and now we're somewhere else like Mark Hall mm -hmm. um, and, or are coming in like Mirasola. Um, and they all, for the most part, wrestled really well and had a big crowd behind them. And we'll get, like you said, we'll get into the crowd aspect of it in a little bit, but it felt like a home, a home match for a lot of them. And I think that played a big part in in some of these matches i mean you'd like to think that it doesn't matter but i think it does to some extent um and we'll get to we'll talk about the format and how it drug out way longer than it needed to mm -hmm. and i'm still tired two days later <laughs> um but just overall i mean uh, we have a, an amazing team i think we have a very dangerous team um uh, it's going to be it's going to be a challenge for for Zane and for Spencer to to qualify their weights, so but I think they can both very much do it. It would be awesome to see all six of them go to Paris. Yeah, yeah, it certainly would. Um, I think Jo was what one point away from qualifying for um, which Olympics was that? Was that Rio? That was, was Tokyo. Was, that was no, to Tokyo. Yeah, yeah that yeah. was Tokyo. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it's been a while since we had 57 or excuse me, 65 qualified. I think that was the only one that we weren't qualified at last time, but super confident in the team that we have. It was great to finally see, truly see Spencer on the senior level. Obviously, we've seen him at the open, but this was a different, a different field of guys. Um, and shit, like 57 we expected it to be as amazing as it really was, but you talked about how Lilladal and Forrest were, were great, but then you have um, you have blaze who's now on the oh, national yeah. team, right? You yeah. are, are the third spot on the national team at 57 kilos came down to two high school juniors. So like it was like watching that match and seeing blaze win, what was it? Seven, one or eight, one over Jack's forest was just like man we we're we're going to be in some pretty good hands you know we've got a lot of depth you know i know we talked about it during the women's side of things but like 
we even have a lot more depth for from the men, you know, and then on the NCA level, all that's going to translate. So we we get hopefully, you know, four years of of watching these kids in their respective singlets, wherever they may go. I know people are talking about is Blaze going to go to, you know, join his brother at Purdue? Is he going to go to, um, you know, Penn State? You know, Lilladal is already a, a Nittany Lion guy. He's already committed to Penn State. Jax Forrest, who knows where he's going to go? I think it's going to be Oklahoma State, to be completely honest. Um, that's where things are leaning, at least if you just pay attention to it. You know, so who knows where these guys are going to end up, but it's going to be super entertaining for quite some time and cannot wait to see them on that next level. Um, I found myself to- trying to figure out, like, what weight those kids are going to be because they're not going to be that little. No. <laughs> like some of those kids have some frames on them that it's like, okay. Yeah. Jack's especially stood out to me. Like as soon as he actually fills out and gets some, some man size, he's going to be a big boy. Yeah, Cause he's already taller than Dayton. Yeah. You know, so, you know, say he does end up going to Oklahoma state. He's not going to, if he's a 33 for, he'll be a 33 for one year, possibly. Right. And, you know, you also got to remember is he's 17 already. So he's going to be pretty filled out by the time he makes it to the college scene anyway. So like, you know, him, Bo Bassett, 17, still in high school, like you can't take anything away from those. Those guys compete and they compete very hard. You know, we're going to we're going to see a lot of those guys kind of hit a log jam. So I think we've got a lot of years of seeing these guys compete for NCAA titles as well as world and Olympic titles and you know, I think it's a it's a testament to Jordan Burroughs, honestly, and it's a testament to you know Kyle Dake and and David Taylor, you know, probably more so Burroughs, obviously because he came first of just the amazing amount of success that he had that put freestyle more in the eye of literally every kid coming up, where they saw how cool it was to not just win an NCAA championship but win uh, an olympic gold or or win a freestyle gold right so like obviously huge but like that really is a testament to the things that burroughs has created and obviously we'll dig into that a little bit more but like seeing these high schoolers and how they're already on the next level of what, they, <laughs> what they're doing absolutely incredible i think what was it lilladal and forest both ended up beating um, who was the it? Shazer. The Shazer and 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 then Liam, right? Like, yeah, both these guys, right? Like these guys have been out of the college scene or through a college room for so long, and they both end up losing to some up and comers. That's a testament to a lot of the depth that we have for sure. Um, any thoughts on freestyle guys? Uh, I mean, and. In- Aaron Brooks, like I was yeah. saying before this got going, you know, before we started recording here, like I was at my son's baseball game and literally one of the dads came over to me and was like, so Brooks over Taylor, huh? Like, that's pretty big. It's like <laughs> big enough to have some, you know, parents at a, a 10 year old baseball game come to talk to me about it. That very rarely happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He shut down Taylor's offense. That's not, that's not even something that Yazdani has done. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, Taylor's turned it into his own offense too. Yeah. Like Yazdani has, he's lost to Taylor five of the six times, you know, and now you you've got Aaron Brooks who scored his own takedown on the first match and then scored it on, you know, with his defense in the second one, Taylor scored one point in both matches, you know, like that's not something that you see. I don't think David Taylor has been stymied on getting a takedown since his NCAA final against Dake, maybe. Right. Like it just doesn't really happen. And Mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, Aaron Brooks was his training partner for the last Olympics, you know, now he's taking him out and taking his spot is incredible. And, you know, you could, you could see that Aaron was was inching closer and closer. And, you know, I, I forget who I talked. It might have been Mason Beckman. I think he may have sent me a text or something talking about um, Brooks beating Taylor in the first one. And, you know, I was like, even if even if it's not 
today you know i think it was it was the the day of the the finals i was like even if it's not today i think aaron does eventually take over the spot at 86 and i think that he it, it's possible that he does beat taylor to do it i didn't know that it would be two straight matches like that you <laughs> you you'd, and you i mean you knowing david taylor you don't bet against him right you're just like even it it is aaron brooks i love aaron brooks to death he's another one of those kids that i watch coming up and and you know talked to his dad yesterday you still are like Taylor's going to get one and it just never came in. It never happened. Aaron Brooks looked phenomenal throughout the entire tournament, gave up his first takedown in, I think a calendar year. I don't think he's given up a takedown in forever to a guy that is coming into the Penn state room in Marisola, right? Like that's the first takedown. And I think even the first match that Aaron Brooks has trailed in, in a very long time, you know, so like kudos to Penn state on their recruiting. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, Holy shit. That match was, was insane. What was it like, Robbie? What was it like to kind of watch Nittany lion fans tear at each other a little bit being, at, it was an Aaron Brooks versus David Taylor match. Honestly, the feeling that I got, was that there was a lot more support behind Brooks than I expected. Um, I don't know if that's a, a recency thing with him, you know, just winning another national title for them, but it felt like there was a lot more people who were, were on his, I'm going to say on his side, but were pulling for him um, than, than Taylor. And I don't know if it's like just an underdog story or, or what, but I mean, you don't expect the, the reigning Olympic champion to go down two straight. And it was super impressive. Um, it was kind of weird just in general with, with so many Nittany Lion, Nittany Lion finals to see and to talk to them afterwards about how it all works in the room uh, with Brooks and Taylor specifically. I mean, Brooks hit on they They haven't wrestled each other in, in quite a while. They kept them separate in the room and kept them away from each other. Um, coaches kind of worked separately with them and i think it was similar at other weights like zane and, and nick um they don't go together in the room because they're ultimately going to compete for the same spot so i mean but you look at that roster and you go down these lists and you think you know, holy shit you can't even imagine what a practice looks like in there i mean you're just seeing multiple world team members just like it's got to be like watching a practice at, at the olympic center at the uh in, in Colorado no, Springs. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's crazy to think how, how much talent is in that room. Um, and I think the fans have gotten pretty spoiled by that and have some, you know, different expectations than most people do now. Yeah. Guys, we finally like got Spencer Lee versus, versus Thomas Gilman. <sighs> finally happened. It finally happened. Um, Spencer looked so good, man. For having not really, really competed in freestyle in, in years, like, and he got that same sort of uh, finish, you know, where his his leg was extended, and he ended up using that to uh, kind of hook the the bar arm in there and get those turns to, you know, really break the lead open uh, against Gilman, and then you know at the end Gilman was just like, "This sucks. I'm gonna lay down now." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, just did lost. you guys did you guys see the interview after um, the first day when Gilman knew he was wrestling Lee? He kind of in his interview he said, "No, there's no bad blood between Lee between Lee and me. There's no bad blood between me and Brands." Um, I respect. It was a weird Lee. interview. Yeah, it kind of seemed like he kind of had a feeling that this might happen. You know, I just kind of vibe I got the way Gilman was really. Um, he's at Penn State now. He's different than when he was at Iowa, so he's a little more at peace as a person. But I may have just reading in that too much. But it just seemed very weird. He was like, "Yeah, especially he's a really good wrestler. I respect him a lot." And it's almost like he saw the writing on the wall. I'm not sure. Yeah, I I, I agree. He's, I mean, he kind of hit on it. You know, a change in his faith, and and you know, kind of the same line we we hear quite often from a lot of the guys that are in that room. Um, how they you know, rely on that. And that's a big part of their, their day to day. Um, and it wasn't as much before him coming there. So I don't know if he's really kind of taken that 
you know, to, to its kind of extent and saying it's out of his hands and what happens happens. And he's at peace with that. Or, you know, the, the feeling that I got, was, he, you know, was, was kind of resigned to the fate of uh, it is what it is. He knew, I felt kind of similar, like he knew what was coming. Um, but if you watch, you watch how Spencer looked the whole first day, everybody knew what was coming. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't surprised to see that. I was surprised that it was, wasn't, it didn't go three. I was hoping it would go three. Um, but Spencer just dominated. He did, you know, he did what we've expected him to do for a very long time. And he did that to somebody who's won a world championship and a, and a couple uh silvers as well. So, I mean, he did it to the top guys in the world. That's what we've been waiting for him to do for what the last decade. So, I mean, I hope that he does the same thing in Paris. I think the other thing, though, now. that is is so refreshing is that, you know, you see it in sports all the time when guys get hurt over and over and over again. And every time they get surgery, every time they, they come back from it, it's it's a diminished version of that same person, right? And so I think the natural fear from everybody is that, oh, is this... It, are we going to get the version of Spencer Lee that we know we we want to see, right? Is that person ever going to be back? And uh, he he looked as good as I think we've ever seen him look. Um, so it, it certainly does not look diminished, which is encouraging. Yeah, fifty seven was a it was a revenge factory essentially. You had mm-hmm. Fix beating Suriano, you know. You had Gilman then beating Fix. And then, I mean, I don't think it's revenge, but you had kind of a grudge match that we've been waiting to see between Gilman and Spencer Lee. So, like, there was just, like, a number of levels to everything. I was very surprised that Gilman looked the way he did against Fix, beating him 6 nothing. you know. And, uh, you know, everyone's going to be like, well, Fix doesn't shoot. Well, if he doesn't shoot, then he shouldn't have beat Nick Suriano the way that he did. Yeah. And he beat Nick Suriano bad. You know, he did. That's That's a big that's a big win you know and obviously everybody's gonna make the joke that's what happens when you don't wrestle with headgear no headgear to pull blah 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 whatever whatever but (laughs) fix wrestled very well especially with that being his first match you know obviously it's not two hours right off the scale he he had a buy in the first round but still you know it was impressive to see how fix was how he wrestled being down at the weight um, we already touched on Jack Sparrow. He gave Gilman all he wanted. Jack Sparrow was mm-hmm. in that match the entire time. The thing that sucks for him is that Gilman is a defensive master when it comes to not getting taken down, you know, and he, Jack Sparrow isn't there yet. But the, and fact the strength that, differential there too, I think, yeah, played a big part. Very big one. Dad strength. Yeah. Big one, right? Like, it's a real thing. It's just different. And, but I was, I think that's where I was probably the most impressed with Jax Forrest because he just went at Gilman, didn't back down, was shooting leg attacks and was coming forward and and taking ground. And it was just like, man, this kid is, this kid is legit. Like he's absolutely legit, you know? So, you know, I think that if you didn't know before that kind of solidified it, um, 65 is really anybody's game. I wouldn't have been, Surprised to see Zane lose to Nick Lee or, or or anything else like that. I think the surprise there was was Larkin, um, you know, and Mendez. Honestly, Larkin looked really good even in a loss against Yanni. Mendez looked amazing against Yanni. Um, you know, I think when you know that Yanni is the kind of guy that wants to sit the corner, you get both his legs off the mat and you drive through him, and that's exactly what Mendez did, right? And mm-hmm. You know, Yanni's feet looked a little slow, honestly. Um, I think the weight cut may maybe have, maybe has got had gotten to him a little bit, and then the match with Larkin really took a lot out of him. And you know, Mendez was raring and ready to go, and he blew through him a number of times. A couple of fours later, and you know, the match is over. So tremendous performance by Mendez as well, uh, as well as Larkin. Larkin was uh, what red shirt in last year. So it's going to be fun to see what he brings to that Arizona state lineup. Um, but yeah, Mendez, Mendez looked great. I think I was surprised on how sluggish Yanni looked in that match, uh, against Mendez. Um, you know, but ultimately it's going to be interesting to see who moves up 
I think there's a number of guys that were at 65. Pentelio, obviously, James Green. I think maybe Yanni moves up, even though 65 has kind of been his spot. Um, maybe he be big up. for him. It does, but I don't know. Who knows, right? Like they're yeah. they're all kind of the same size, right? I think Yanni Except is Pentelio, who could be an eighty four. Pentelio is he's kind of a large human. Um, but yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see who moves up from sixty five and and ends up at ends up at seventy uh, for Worlds in October. Um, obviously, trials are before then, but it's just, we're gonna have a number of guys that that do make. The move from 74 up to 79, I think, you know, maybe we see Nolf do that. Um, he's obviously been at 79 before. Um, the real question is what happens to those guys at 86 that didn't go down to 74 that were at 79, right? Like, does Chance Marsteller try to get back down to 79 where he was on the world team last year? Or is it too big of a cut for him now that he's up at 86? You know, those are kind of my questions of like who goes where. Um, does Taylor would... move up to ninety two? Who knows? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't. I don't think that he will. But shit, it's there. Mm-hmm. You know, it we could just have Zahid do it again. Zahid last will year. probably do it. Zahid will probably move up again too. I would think Deeringer would probably. I mean, drop down to seventy nine and try and get it done. He's probably more in line with that weight than 86 anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if Derringer wants to do it. Um, you know, when I talked to him at NCAAs, he was just like getting close to the end, right? So it, it'll be, a, I think for each one of these guys, it'll certainly be a, do I have it in me? I just put all this to make the Olympic team. Do I still have it in me to now? you know, maybe take a break and then turn back around and try to make the world team. Um, But we certainly have a number of guys that could possibly do it. I think Dayton Fix tries to do it at 61. Obviously, Mm -hmm. we already know that Vito was going to attempt to do it and come off his injuries and, and, and do it at 61. So I think we have a good number of guys. Obviously, you said Zahid was at 92 before. Um, So certainly we'll see. See what happens. Um, Trumbull Trumbull doesn't look like a full size ninety seven to me. So could he drop to ninety two? I think so. Um, hell of a weekend for him though. Yeah, he looked awesome. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> and we've still got a couple other weights to hit on. I think we hit seventy four last. Is probably seventy four and 80, 86 would be last would be the the better idea here. Um, but super super impressed with Trumbull. I mean, he had a a back and forth match that he came back and won against Diallo to get, you know, to keep going. And, you know, he didn't challenge Kyle, but he held him to a lower score than a lot of people do. Mm-hmm. Um, Kyle kind of hit on that. He was, you know, just waiting for that chest wrap and letting him in on his legs and trying to use that leverage since he's six, six, he's very low. Um, and he wasn't able to, to finish that because Kyle's just so solid positionally and, literally um these hard to wrap and, and get through but otherwise i mean fantastic weekend second place finish for you know him coming off a u23 championship in the red shirt year so that's a positive sign for the wolf pack yeah yeah you said it we haven't dug into 74 yet 74 and i, I think we said this you know before the the tournament even happened it was the weight class to watch not just because Burroughs is there, but <clears throat> there's a ton of parody that's in up and down that entire uh, entire bracket. Obviously, seeing how Messenbrink was going to do in there, um, you know, he pisses off Burroughs. Um, I don't think that I understand why Burroughs got pissed off. I don't like how he reacted. Um, so I will say that, but I understand why. Um, specifically that match, I think that the ref lost control of it. Um, you know, Messenbrink was continuing to basically poke at Jordan, right? Like, and this isn't like, I'll put my bias on the table. I'm certainly friends with Jordan Burroughs and his wife and family and everything else, but it's a, 
there's a certain level of poking you can do until somebody responds and you know the match is stopped within the first minute for Messenbrink clubbing super hard I'm all for you know clubs and and being physical but when you start to wind up a little bit and you're trying to put a little bit extra on it it's too much no matter who you're wrestling right and then you know he pushes Jordan over when they go out of bounds that ultimately it's a good it's a good thing Jordan is as flexible as he is you push me over like that I'm done my knees are <laughs> busted out right like it's not good you know you push somebody over like that it's potential to hurt them you know and then he continues after the whistle again and you know kind of hyper extends Jordan's knees even after things are over and then that's when Jordan responded you know and then even after Jordan responded I don't know if people really took notice of it but I think it was like the first or second point that Messenbrink scored. They had went out of bounds. Jordan had went out of bounds and Messenbrink kept his hand on the back of Jordan's head, pushing it into the mat. It's just like all of these things are compounding here, guys. I understand that, you know, Messenbrink is at home. So, you know, no one's going to see the little things because it's not like he gave as much force to it as Jordan did. Jordan was, was like, a, okay, knock it off. You know, Messenbrink was, you know, nipping at his heels the whole time, pulling at his shirt, right? Like doing those those little things that just kind of piss somebody off. And Jordan had enough of it. So do I think that Jordan respond Jordan's response was right? No. But I understand why. You know, I, I completely understand why. And for people to then want to turn Jordan into a villain or say that Jordan turned heel. He didn't turn heel. He got pissed off. Like there's a, there's a very big difference. He wasn't the heel leading up to any of this, you know, but Nittany Lyon kind of turned him into that with his comments during the NCAA finals. And then him walking into their house and pushing one of their new prize possessions into the mat. So that's going to happen. But. Um, well, it's tough too. Cause it's like, he was kicking Messing Brink's butt. Yeah. You know, and so then it's got to be frustrating too when you're like actually, you know, winning pretty handedly and you got this annoying kid out there literally biting at your ankles. <laughs> Just like, dude, get off. It's like, I, my, I always yell at my oldest son when he's beating up his, his younger brother. And I'm sure Miles was being super annoying, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I yell at Corbin. You know, that's how it goes. So, um, and at the same time too, you know, if you're Jordan, you're, you're fighting to to hold on to that spot and just to get to that next match. And and the last thing you want is some overzealous kid hurting you, at, you know, right before some of the, uh, the biggest matches of your career at that point. So, yeah, I, I, I probably would have done the same thing. Yeah. And yeah. I like Mitchell Messenbrink too. He's awesome. Mm-hmm. But... Love him. Yeah. He's awesome. And, I think that's it kind of gets lost in a lot of it is people just seeing Jordan's reaction and not looking at everything that led up to it. And you're right. I mean, a lot of hard clubs, a lot of just purposely getting in his way on restarts, just just dumb shit that was clearly done to to poke at him and to get a reaction. And get, that's exactly what they wanted. They wanted to get under his skin and they did. And I mean, ultimately his reaction was not good and that's not the way he probably should have reacted but I don't blame him. I probably would have done the same thing. Um, but he was also ready to let that die at that point. And then you saw Mastin Brink continue to push at it. And that's when the crowd came in and that just kind of amplified everything. And that, you know, blood over the next round. And I think, you know, for as seasoned as Jordan is and for as much as he's gone through and the different places he's gone through it and, and the hostile environments that he's wrestled in, I think, with everything that was weighing on him for this tournament with as, you know, legacy defining as this tournament, he, you know, thought it was for him. Um, I think having that crowd sway and having, you know, that interaction with Messenbrink was, was mentally taxing on him um, in a way that I, you don't normally see for Jordan. And maybe I, I'm reading too much into it, but I, you know, that, that, finals match the the challenge finals against Noel he didn't look like himself um physically or 
mentally didn't seem like he was in the right headspace in the match. And, you know, we talk about the format. I mean, it was like 30 minutes later. There wasn't a lot of turnaround between those two matches. So there's not a lot of time for him to reset and refocus. And, you know, this would be the, what, the third Nittany Lion guy in a row he had to go through. So there's a lot. I mean, there's just, it's just, it was a lot. And the way that that bracket stacked up was very interesting and probably the worst possible path for Jordan. Yeah. So I think there was just a lot, lot on him and he didn't handle it as well as he normally does. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the thing, right? We're so used to seeing him handle everything with grace and tact and, and, you know, very calculated when he says things, he didn't, he didn't say that stuff about, uh, Sirachi not knowing what it was going to do, but he also didn't expect competitors to be like, Oh, that's dirty. It's like, wait, what? Like, no, it's not. It's not dirty. Like you're a competitor. You're it's a combat sport. Yeah, it's, you're the the you're point stupid not to go after to weakness. go after the weakness of your competitor. <clears throat> he was asked a question. He didn't just like. I think in the end, he outright said like, "Yeah." Like he reiterated it in the end of of the NCAA's after I watched it back. But like that came from a question DC had asked. And he I also think didn't say he would thing. spit in his face like Carter did. So there's that yeah, too. I, I think that's a <clears> that's that's a that's low. I do. That's just low. Like that's not, that's not respectful. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm all for talking shit, you know, hell when I was a wrestler and football player and fight, I talk shit with the best of them, but like, let's, let's tone it down a little bit. Like that's, that's disgusting. That's low. You don't do that. That's not well, even something that you say. That was one of those things too, where even like I heard, I heard the interview and I was like, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah nobody spits in somebody's face that's like immediate grounds for face punches you yeah. know like that's not nobody like carter you're, you're saying things to say things but you wouldn't do that i think the other thing though that, that is important because you know we're, we're talking about a lot of the negative stuff but there's definitely some negative things that happened and highlight but i also wanted to highlight real quickly like i don't know i had a really good time watching Nick Lee and Zane Rutherford kind of come off their matches at the same time and realize they were going to wrestle each other in the finals and kind of yeah, give each other really the cool. side hug. Like that sort of stuff was pretty cool. Um, the Aaron Brooks, David Taylor, like, you know, getting hurt right in his face and kind of telling him that he was, you know, the reason the, 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 the trailblazer essentially for a lot of those, those Nittany Lion wrestling club guys, you know, so there's definitely a lot of the positives that, that need to be highlighted too. Cause you know, obviously the negative and the interviews and the base spitting stuff like gets clicks and, and people watching it and talking about it. Cause that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> but, but a lot of good, good things happen too, right? These guys are all essentially coworkers, you know, yeah. on, on some Dake, level. <clears throat> Dake hit on that too. Um, after his, his win and with everything he's gone through in the last couple of weeks, like mm -hmm. how important that the program was and everybody in there, and how supportive they were as you know as a family and as a team and as a program so there's certainly a lot of great things and if there wasn't good things going on you wouldn't have the results that you have and you wouldn't have the depth of talent you have there i mean, no, I mean nobody's nobody's saying that it's not a phenomenal team um but i think we would be disingenuous if we didn't highlight these things that clearly played a big role in the weekend totally yeah yeah obviously those are the things that you know, we're we're obviously talking about the negative things because they were so glaring, right? Like the mm -hmm. wrestling was awesome and it was <clears throat> everything we expected. But if you would have told me that the the Penn State crowd, and obviously it's not the entire crowd, I'm not saying every single person in that venue was you know, booing Jordan Burrow, but it was a majority of people that were booing Jordan Burroughs because he went back at a, a kid, essentially. I'm sorry, he's 20. He's not a kid anymore, right? Like, Jax Forrest is a kid. He's 17. It's not like he he punched, he pushed Jax Forrest into the mat. He hit Mitchell Messenbrink, who's 20, right? Like, he's a grown man. He's doing grown man things. And... That's how grown men handle stuff. So that's what happened. And anybody saying, oh, he's a college kid, whatever, whatever, 
let's let's throw that out because you you can't be booing Dayton Fix one week for being too old to be in college, but then you're calling them college kids over here. It just doesn't it doesn't add up here, folks. So you know, I think it was horrible the way that Jordan was treated, and like I said, full bias on the table, but it, it just wasn't warranted. You're gonna scream at him that his career is over. I'm pretty damn sure that before Nittany Lion Wrestling Club became a thing, that man was at the water cooler saying, man, that Jordan Burroughs was really, really good. He won another world title for USA. But now you, you, you know, you want to, you want to turn tail and scream at somebody who just put his heart and everything else, his entire lifestyle on the line, you know, like he changed his entire life to make 74 kilos his entire life. It has been a serious input of effort for him to do those things. Sacrifice from him and his family and not just him, but every single wrestler that was out there. So for him to scream at Jordan, for him to scream at anybody and for any of those fans to scream at anyone that is out there laying it on the line. Like I understand it's a sport, but just because you, you know, pay $35 doesn't mean you get to degrade somebody as they walk off the mat you just don't and that goes for any profession it just that's just not how shit is done and it was absolutely disgusting and it was just like you know everybody's watching the same video zeb sent me the video when i asked about it and it was just like man like this is this is gross for them to to treat anyone like that let alone somebody who is a seven-time world and olympic champion and has done nothing but hoist the flag with the utmost respect I, I like to think that even that guy's embarrassed, you know, and feels bad about it. Like, but you know, it, it, this is one of those things where, where it happens. And hopefully what this can end up being is just a reminder of what not to be in the future. Right. And so people can show up to some of these events, the next, next big event, you know, going on and, and walk in with an intentionality around their character and what they're going to be doing and how they're going to behave. Cause yeah, I don't think, anyone including probably the guy yelling that feels good about it today yeah you know what what pissed me off about that and i was right next to zeb when jordan was coming back under the tunnel is that where that guy ran was into a crowd of kids who had been hanging over the edge getting autographs the entire weekend so this guy runs a section over through a bunch of actual children to talk shit to a seven-time world Olympic champion saying your career is over, go home, you're soft, all these things. And like, th there's no place for that. Like, I'm not a fan of booing in general, like support your guys. If you, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't feel any reason to boo anybody. I'm, I don't, I don't think I've ever booed anybody in my life. Yeah. Um, support your wrestlers, support your team. You don't have to put anybody down to do that. And you certainly don't have to run across the stadium into a crowd of kids to talk to shit to somebody who would kill you if you were on the mat with him. Like, Out of the way, kids! I gotta boo this man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what that's that's what bothered me the most about it is like, what kind of example are you setting? Like, take a step back and look at this. You were literally running into children to yell at somebody about their career being done, like. Uh, it's it was baffling to me i was i was surprised that jordan reacted to it yeah um yeah mark manning was all on it too told him need a <laughs> he said you need a piece of fucking humble pie that was my favorite <laughs> part uh but it's the whole situation was weird and i mean nobody saw jordan after that he didn't come back the second day and i don't know it's just a weird a, a very surreal last hour of that night um, it just, it kind of cast a pall over the whole thing and it was weird. And then you had do all the shit down he was doing too, that, which is a whole other episode of this in itself. But I, I, I am going to comment real quick. Cause I was getting into it with people on Twitter about that. And it's like, wait a minute, why am I having to explain to you all of the reasons why Downey not coming back to wrestle is not the same as James Green and Alec Pantelio or some of these other guys. <laughs> these are not, they're not the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> they're, 
They're very different, very different people, very different levels of integrity and professionalism in and around this sport. <laughs> How are they compared the same? Don't tell me to come with the same energy with those other guys, because I'm not doing that. They've they've earned a different energy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not to harp on the JB thing, but it's, like someone mentioned, it's really rare to see him snap back, especially to a fan like that. Um, yeah, it might, might sound weird, but I was trying to put myself in his shoes, you know, and not his actual rushing shoes, like his literal shoes <laughs> there and be like, you know, he won a gold medal in 2012, didn't get it done in 16, didn't make the, you know, the team last go around. This is literally his last chance mm-hmm. and his dreams is, you know, maybe life in terms of wrestling is over now, you know, competitively, um, wrestling at a, a high Olympic level. Right. And just the lowest of the lows that that guy maybe has ever felt. And this guy, fat guy drinking a beer, you know, whatever, <laughs> coming up with no athletic bone in his body, telling him he's done and whatever. It's just, yeah, just the humility part of it too. Even if you don't like Jordan as an athlete, you know, as a person, respect how he's feeling at that moment too, you know. It, it, it's just really, really bizarre to me that people can, you know, really kick people when they're down like that. Just kind of sad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the even even within that, going back on on the mat, the referees, and we talked about this before we came on, how things are ref domestically as opposed to how they are refed internationally is wild. Um I think in in the match with Jordan Burroughs and and Nolf, that Nolf gets hit with at least two passives. I mean, he scored the only takedown of the match in like the first, what, 20 seconds of the second period and then didn't shoot again. And obviously Jordan, it's up to Jordan to score, but Jordan got put on the clock in the first period and then no one else got put on the clock after that. Right. It's just like, yeah, like not a warning, nothing came. And it didn't even come from the judge or the chair either. There was no paddles lifted of saying, Hey, listen, we got to put him on the clock. He's being a defensive wrestler. Like this is, this is negative wrestling is what I think the referees call it. So like that didn't even happen. Right. And then obviously the, the ref in, in Jordan's match against Messenbrink completely lost control of that match. If he decides that he's going to warn Messenbrink earlier, then there is no caution in one that comes against Jordan later on because Messenbrink has already stopped it or maybe Messenbrink gets hit with a caution in one there instead of Jordan. You know what I mean? So like, there's just like a lot of mat control that just didn't add up. I didn't, I, I, I was honestly like scratching my head. Like how is, how is Nolf able to continue to get his heels to the edge of the mat and then circle back in and heels to the edge of the mat, circle back in, right? Like obviously it's Jordan's job to either push him out or take him down, whatever else. But like, we've seen referees involve themselves in situations where a guy or a girl is getting ready to score and they stop it and warn them and say, let's pick up the action. So it was just, just kind of a head scratcher. I just didn't, you know, and it happened in multiple matches too, where guys would score points and then just be alt, you know, ultra defensive the rest of the time. And it was just like, where are the passive points? Because you know, when they get to the Olympics, they're going to get hit with passive. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. 30 seconds. Yeah. You, you will be put on the shot clock if for negative wrestling. So it was just like, I, I don't, I don't understand why things aren't being refereed the same domestically as they are internationally, you know, and I, and it was refreshing to see Sammy Julian on the, on the whistle the second day after, you know, being, um, what was he doing? Uh, challenges and stuff the first day. So it's refreshing to see him out there. And obviously he'll probably be another guy that's at the Olympics again this year, but it's just, there's, it was just night and day, you know, from how you watch international refs as opposed to the domestic ones. And it just didn't, it just didn't add up for me, you know? Yeah. I didn't see a single hand slap. <laughs> yeah. None of them. None of them. None of them. Yeah, one thing I didn't like overall, too, uh, seeing all these matches, and I think it's the current rule set, obviously, but 
I had to figure out something about grounding because I've seen guys kind of get pushed <laughs> towards the edge and just go to knees and get pushed out and it's no points. Yeah. Um, you know, and like, what are you going to do? Stand the guy up and push him? Like there needs to be something done. I don't know what, but that's supposed to be a caution. That's something that's, that I thought Perry they kind of did something about. like that. Yeah. Yeah. That if they intentionally drop to, to become grounded to avoid points, it's supposed to be a caution in one. Yeah. They made and, that a point like a couple of years ago. After yeah. Guys, yeah. And it, continued guys are doing was, that to Burroughs. Yeah. That was not called at all. And I mean, people were grounding themselves the entire weekend. Yeah, maybe they were far enough within the passivity zone that it wasn't, you know, within their threshold. But yeah, I saw guys. It might have been Nolf wrestling JB, or it might have been another match. Some guy, same wrestler, did it at least three times in a row. Backed out on their knees, and nothing yeah. was called. It's like some something's got to give sometime, or you yeah. can't just keep doing, it, especially with the lead. And that's the thing is, right. I think it will be called at the Olympics. It's yeah. another thing that is it just very be. different domestically that is not called. You know when when we were at these world and olympic tournaments it's just very very different so it's just like man i i don't know but robbie you touched on it before the the format format wasn't good it wasn't good at no point should aaron brooks be on the treadmill cutting weight so that he has to make scratch weight to wrestle the Six next hours day later. yeah and and not just wrestle the next day he's got the olympic champ waiting for him at night right like it just guys we got to do we have to do better with schedule we have to do better to for our talent for our talent like i know that we can't do final x because that's that's a, a patented whatever right flow owns that is what it is we can't do that for the olympic trials but i think we can do better in terms of having the challenge tournament a week sooner level the playing field, allow guys to rest up, rehydrate, go back to training, get ready for the main event, right? Like, and then you allow for more marketing, you allow for people like us to talk these matches up, you know, you allow for stuff like that to happen. You know, I think the, the number of, of people that were sitting out, I think it was what every single guy that was sitting out as opposed to David Taylor won their match. Um, I think there was only, I think the same thing happened on the women's side. I think Kennedy Blades was the only one to to win on the women's side for any of the, yeah. the girls that were sitting out. So it was just like, obviously you want to protect the medalist, and I think we can still do that, but I think we can do a little bit better for the talent that comes out of the challenge tournament because having to go cut weight super late at night, try to get you know some sleep, and then try to rehydrate like it's just not it's not good ultimately our guys and girls are warriors and they're able to go out there and compete but i i wonder how many of them are just like i'm at 70 percent right now you know jakara for instance i'm at 70 percent right now i have a busted knee after surgery i just wrestled some of the best that you know we have in, in this country now i have to wrestle you know a multiple time world and olympic champion like that's hard to do. The format needs to change. And I also think that a lot of people were complaining that it was the Nittany Lion Invitational and it was just a home match for them and trying to go to some sort of neutral setting. I think, you know, in the past we did it in Nebraska when Jordan was at Nebraska. We've now, you know, catered to our, our other most talented club in the country of Nittany Lion maybe next time we don't do something like that, right? Like we have more of a neutral setting for guys and girls. I mean, I'm pretty sure that Newark was kind of a neutral setting um, for, for final X. So like, and it wasn't bad, you know, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't a bad setup at all, but like definitely something to look at is the, the format, you know, where we're having these as well. I don't want to say just because Nittany Lion had, you know, every fan in the entire stadium, but I'm saying like, let's level the playing field. Guys got to travel. We got to get it done somehow and have a better schedule for the guys and girls to weigh in. Yeah. They waited at 7 a.m. both days and both days didn't finish till at least 11 o'clock, 10, like 10 45 for the finals. Jeez. Like that's, that's too long. And if you're cutting weight, 
Like, I mean, Aaron coming off, you know, at, at 1030 for his last match, cooling down a little bit and then, you know, resetting and having to cut weight, you know, because all of them have to cut weight because they all cut weight and they drink and they eat throughout the day and you're going to gain a few pounds. That's just the nature of the beast. So you're going to have to cut that off and doing that, you know, at midnight, one in the morning, and then getting hopefully three, four hours of sleep turn around and doing it again. It's not like he's sleeping in the arena. He's got to go home and he's got to get back there to be ready to go at seven in the morning. So you're getting back there at six to, to run and make sure you're getting that last cut off. So, I mean, it's, it's not safe. If anything else, it's, it's not a safe thing to put them through. And we're, you know, we, we, we're so on board with USADA and then pulling them back to everybody get tested to make sure that playing field is, is level and safe, but we're not worried about them getting four hours of sleep because we're scheduling shit poorly that's not yeah and the hard part too is that nobody knew what the fuck was going on the whole weekend <laughs> nobody knew the schedule the athletes didn't the coaches didn't the media didn't nobody knew what the schedule was nobody knew when the challenge tournament was finishing up nobody knew when third place matches were you had coaches coming to ask media people we had media people asking the operations people nobody knew it was such just like a vague well, here's the schedule we're going to do, and we don't know when anything's actually going to happen. It was, it was just very poorly run from the beginning, or poorly set up. It was it was run well, uh, but poorly set up and, and scheduled from the beginning, and we've got to do better. That's not not going to work. Yeah. yeah, I saw Jordan Oliver tweet out that he was 22 pounds over the first day going into the second day. That's 10 yeah, kilos. So, that's a lot of... Yeah, yeah wrestling... What four matches that day, having to cut all that, a few hours of sleep, waking up, doing like, and then you got those boxers that are making millions of dollars drinking beer on the scale, three and a half pounds over. I'm sure you saw that one this weekend, but on purpose. Yeah. yeah. Then you can bet two million dollars on yourself and see what happens. Yeah. It's just yeah. a joke with those guys, but yeah, boxing is not what it used to be. That's that's a whole other kind. What do you know about boxing, Mister Holmes? Not a damn thing. <laughs> Oh, that's a that's a com definitely a conversation for another day. Um, but I do want to I do want to kind of wrap things up and kind of end on a good note. Honestly, our 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 team up and down, full confidence that we're gonna bring home a good bit of medals. Um, you know, and and not only that, we're gonna bring home a good bit of medals of the guys that made it. We're also going to have some really solid coaching of guys that retired. You know, Mark Hall leaving his shoes in the middle of the mat. Alex Marinelli saying that he's going to devote uh, his his time to coaching. Jaden Cox going to be a dad now, right? Like just having, was it twins just a little bit ago? Mm -hmm. You know, and that was the probably the most wholesome thing that I love seeing come out of it is all these guys and girls, you know, Adeline bringing her twins on and, you know, seeing, you know, Jaden with with his family and then you know the videos of of Zane seeing his son as soon as he came off and you know just everybody that had their families there you know and seeing the videos of everyone that has the the family support you know I can remember growing up where wrestling wasn't one of the sports that had the financial support for those guys to literally just be wrestlers and now they can and that's the amazing part about it is there's so much there's more infrastructure behind it. Obviously we still have a very long way to go, but the fact that we have a Jordan Burroughs, the fact that we have a David Taylor and a Kyle Dake and a Kyle Snyder that have made history and Helen, as well as Adeline that have done so much, right. Didn't even speak about <clears throat> how Helen's the first woman to be on three, three Olympic teams. Just amazing that they have the infrastructure that they can do the things that they need to do. They can get the surgeries that they need and not have to worry about, you know, money and, you know, they, they can, they have the support and that's tremendous. You know, what's going to happen with some of the clubs coming up, who's to, who's to say, but like, it is tremendous that we can look up and down and we have W cap when it comes to Greco and we have the, you know, the OTC where, you know, a lot of our athletes are living and then just the athletes that are splitting time between being coaches as well as competitors you know, it's going to be interesting to see who enters the, the tournament at 70 and 79 and 92 um, and 61 to see who ends up going to Worlds. But then how things change 
going into 2025 because there's a number of guys and girls that didn't leave their shoes on the mat this weekend who I'm sure we won't see anymore. Um, and guys that new new people, new faces that we will see that are coming out of the college ranks. Um, so it's going to be super interesting to see kind of how things kind of pan out um, moving forward in the future. Uh, guys, you got anything, any other shout outs, any other positive notes you want to end on before we uh, wrap things up? I was, uh, I tweeted something out about Jaden Cox, his interview. That was, that one kind of got me a little bit, you know, just being in the same shoes, just having kids. And, you know, the way he said, you know, your priorities change and, you know, do I really want to do this? And it's, you know, it's just kind of relatable to me, at least just having two young kids myself and just kind of seeing that in my own life, you know, you, some of your friends are a little more distant, you know, have time to do things you want to do. And I can't even imagine being a wrestler full time. It's like, why do I want to put myself through hell like this just to come up short of my goals and, you know, and, but, you know, positive about that is, you know, he's realizing that he's not going to keep doing it just to earn the paycheck, just to, you know, go through the motions. He's really set up in his mind, Hey, people I used to beat are beating me, you know, I'm losing ground and it, it's good for him to notice that. And, you know, put wrestling in the background a little bit. I'm sure. Hope hope we still involve coaching. I'm sure he'd be a great coach, Jaden. But yeah, that 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 interview really got really got to me a little bit, and that was it was it was good to see and you know hear those words come out of him. His wife Whitney teaches, uh, excuse me, coaches at uh, Adrian College, their women's program. So I don't think he's leaving Ann Arbor or anything. No, nice. Okay, good. No, I think you you kind of hit. Key money to spend. <laughs> I think you hit it on the head, Ryan. And that's something I noticed as well. And just how that was kind of some of the highlights of my weekend was seeing the wrestlers interact with their family, their their kids, their, you know, siblings. Um, I mean, Sarah really hit on how big of a role her brother and her sister play with her. And you see Adeline carrying her kids around and Geneva right behind her helping out. So he's got, you know, sister and kids. And it's just, it really humanized them. Um, in a different way that we don't normally see and it was really cool that I think a lot of people got to see that side of them that that don't normally see that um, so I think that that was I I really liked that part and seeing like how happy the parents were coming back you know realizing their kids going to be an Olympian just there was a lot of really cool things like that and then just anytime you go to an event you know from our side you get to see the people you don't see very often mm-hmm. and you know you realize how great of a sport this is and how many good people there are and you know the relationships that we form with people all over the country you know through this and and you know it's it's always nice to be around those people and kind of feel those those connections and you know recognize that there's a lot of good people out there my last shout out here is uh I just want to go to a retirement party so I can yell your career is over at somebody <laughs> But like it, it'll be fine there. Can you push yourself into a bunch of children to do it? Yeah, out of the way, kids. I saw. <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw Don Palacio. I guess he tracked down that guy that was yelling that he's going to show up to his work and start yelling shit while he's working. <laughs> yeah, Fantastic. Can you imagine just an accountant typing away numbers. And just you so. What are you? <laughs> <laughs> I think that'd be funny. That would be. Yeah, Dylan blocked me on Twitter. I don't know why. Uh, he blocked me because I made fun of him capitalizing every letter. Oh, I probably did the same thing. That's I don't think like he does that anymore. Do. Well, yeah. I don't know. I don't see anything else. Yeah. He he actually tweeted at me for the first time in years. I hadn't. I used to talk to Dylan all the time. I haven't talked to him in a while. And when all this stuff happened, he was he was tweeting back at me, and it was just like, oh wow, yeah, Dylan Place. So he tried to make to the to the Olympics. He wrestled at Pan Ams yeah. and, yeah. and didn't make it. For Argentina, but, Ecuador, uh, Uruguay. Uruguay. Yeah, it was. So, but yeah, I mean, it, it was out of all of it, it was a fun weekend of watching wrestling, seeing how many people were involved, you know, just paying such close attention and just awesome, right? It is, it's great when you're, when you're there. Um, it's awesome when you're able to watch literally everything. Um, NBC did a pretty good job. Peacock did a pretty good job, I will say. Quad box was was nice. They messed up some of the scoreboards some of the time. Um and one of and some of the streams went a little bit haywire some of the times. So they had to fix those. But overall it was pretty good. 
Um, I'm just hoping that moving forward, we do better with the scheduling, honestly, and not just for people that are watching, but people that are in the damn tournament. It needs to be better for them, you know, especially, especially if you're going to run it that way. I mean, honestly, I think we could have, you know, it, it, I think it was run okay with having things continuously moving and men's women's and Greco happening on all four mats and everything else. But yeah, it can, we can certainly do better when it comes to scheduling, but man, it's going to be, like I said, it's going to be interesting to see who is on the team for the non-Olympic weights for worlds there, who gets into coaching a little bit more, who's, you know, who's at world or who's at the, the trials next year. Um, and I think we're going to start to see, uh, kind of a lot more changes with coaching and things like that. I have like seven text messages in a group between Willie and Earl that I probably need to get to. They've been sending me text messages as we've been talking. So must be important. To them. Uh, it must be something because Willie responded. Yeah, I say when Willie responds, that's important. It must be very important. Then. Normally it's just Earl saying stuff in, in our, in the, the group of the three of us. And then Willie may, re- but Willie responded like very quickly. So, um, or he's playing to, Fortnite again, he's doing something, <laughs> he's certainly doing something. But guys, it was a good, another great conversation. We're going to continue to do a lot more of these. Maybe we'll jump back on for us open and see what our age level teams look like. Um, yeah, that's all I got for now. Appreciate you fellas.